okay so good evening everyone so today we will be mainly discussing on the week 6 contents uh, which is mainly based on turbulence okay so in the next week we will be mainly discussing on the iterative methods and also the direct methods which are uh, existing to solve the uh, linear algebraic equations uh, as you have asked so, but uh, mainly this week i want to focus on two things uh, one is Uh, you are coding aspects for uh, uh, navier stokes equation so uh, in the last week uh, we had slightly kind of uh, touched upon uh, the various algorithms which are present to solve the coupled navier stokes equation why i mean why i am saying coupled is because there is pressure velocity coupling in your navier stokes equation so mainly we had uh, kind of touched upon some methods like the simple algorithm the mac algorithm and the projection methods but uh, today i want to uh, specifically discuss on mac algorithm uh, why because it is uh, quite simpler than the other methods also although projection is also a simple method i mean a very easy to implement kind of method okay but uh, anyway i think a good starting point would be mac algorithm so i'll just uh, briefly explain that algorithm along with your simple but we will see a code wherein uh, i have implemented a mac algorithm uh, to solve a lid driven cavity problem okay this lid driven cavity problem you might have uh, uh, studied in your first week contents also that it is a standard benchmark problem wherein we uh, try to solve for the flow velocities and pressure inside a cavity uh, which is enclosed by a lid and the lid is moving with a constant velocity okay so that's the problem which we will be trying to solve today okay that is the first thing now the second thing as i said uh, is your week 6 actual contents which is the turbulence okay so it's a very interesting topic i would say turbulence and although uh, people uh, kind of are bit uncomfortable with this topic because you know there is no uh, there is uh, no universal definition of turbulence and there is no uh, i mean perfect mathematical model or something like that but still it's a very kind of interesting phenomena and with the existing models also we can kind of come up with some good solution so uh, i mean i will try to uh, uh, give some examples so that uh, you kind of get appreciation for turbulence uh, and you kind of uh, get motivated to study turbulence okay uh, to kind of solve turbulence problems and all okay so uh, that's the agenda for today and finally we will be solving some um, your tutorial problems on the turbulence uh, assignment part okay yeah so that uh, so that's the turbulent kinetic energy yeah i will just touch upon the mathematical model but we will not go too much into detail i'll just tell what is that and why it is used i mean the turbulent kinetic energy part and your k epsilon model why they are used and how we can apply them to solve the turbulence equation but what i think is uh, see we can get lost in this uh, world of mathematics but it's uh, very important to kind of understand the physical relevance behind things once you kind of get into that uh, you can go through this uh, models and all i mean that's there okay but i just want to touch upon the introduction because uh, many people might not be very much familiar with this uh, topic itself okay so in detail we can go in but let us see how the time allows okay okay with this uh, let me uh, start with the coding part for your uh, mac algorithm but uh, just before that let me share my screen uh, is my screen visible uh, can you uh, write on the chat box whether my screen is visible or not okay thank you yeah so as i said 
last week we were mainly discussing the nature of this uh, Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, and then we saw what are the challenges which are involved in solving these equations. Uh, one of the biggest challenge is that it is uh, coupled. I mean, the pressure and velocity are coupled, and there is no explicit equation for pressure. Okay, so that's the one of the biggest challenge I would say. The second challenge was that uh, you uh, end up with non-linear equations which are not very easy to solve. The equation, the nature of equations are non-linear, so you cannot come up with a direct implicit method. Okay, because if you even if you are using implicit method, you have to solve non-linear equations. Uh, again, you cannot do that iterative methods and all. Okay, uh, so that will not be available, that option will not be available. You have to go with uh, something like a newton raphson scheme or something which is there to solve your non-linear equations, okay. So that's the aspect. So that is the second challenge. So the third challenge is uh, again you end up with a, a kind of a pressure velocity decoupling when you are going with a, a very common kind of grid, very general grid which you usually use which is called as collocated grid. Okay, when you store all the variables and all the pressure velocity at a center of the control volume you end up with something called as pressure velocity decoupling wherein um, in the momentum equation uh, when you try to predict the velocity now that velocity will not depend on the pressure at that control volume okay which is uh, unphysical okay because pressure drives the velocity and velocity drives the pressure they are both coupled but in this sense when you use collocated grid they become decoupled Okay, so that's the third problem, that third challenge uh, that is again solved using the implementation of a staggered grid, which you have seen last week. Okay, so now, so let us try to get some details about the algorithms and we will go in deep in one particular algorithm and see a code. Okay, uh, so the first uh, type of algorithm which you saw last week to solve this uh, coupled equations was the marker and cell algorithm, uh, MAC algorithm, which is in general called as, okay. So in the marker and cell algorithm, uh, what we try to do is, uh, we try to come up with a pressure Poisson equation. Okay, we try to come up with a pressure Poisson equation. So some of you have joined just now. So uh, good evening, first of all. So what we are discussing is uh, the algorithms which are there to solve the uh, your coupled Navier-Stokes equations and uh, as I have said earlier also today we will be just seeing a code on MAC algorithm okay. So that is why I am discussing now MAC algorithm okay. So as I said so here what we try to solve what we try to do is that we we have a momentum equation right from that momentum equation we have a pressure gradient in that particular momentum equation so that pressure gradient we try to calculate it from the previous time step itself okay now i am assuming that you are solving unsteady state problems so you try to solve the pressure gradient from the previous time step or previous iteration whatever it is okay so then uh, you try to uh, calculate this particular thing okay just let me take the pointer Okay, you try to uh, calculate the residual uh, uh, mass flux, you can say, so throughout through the control volume. Okay, ideally it should go to zero. This value of d should go to zero because of continuity equation. But since you are predicting a velocity which is uh, based on the previous uh, iterations or previous time step pressure, it will not ideally go into zero. And you come up with a Poisson equation uh, wherein you try to kind of calculate the pressure uh, using uh, this uh, uh, dou u star by dou x and other whatever terms are there okay so if i have to specifically say then this uh, pressure poisson equation how do you derive this pressure poisson equation so that's the whole uh, point here so i'm just referring to one of my course slides here wherein uh, the derivation of this uh, pressure poison is given okay uh, although this might not be in detail dealt in your course but just for understanding i'll just explain it within like two or three minutes okay so basically what you do is that you have uh, this momentum equation now you try to manipulate them by taking the 
x uh, derivative of x momentum and y derivative of y momentum and then you try to add them okay so when you uh, sorry when you add them i hope my screen is visible so when you add them uh, you kind of come up with an equation uh, which is directly in terms of dou p uh, dou square p by dou x square plus dou square p by dou y square and the remaining terms are all in terms of velocity so you you need to do the math for that you just need to derive the x momentum with the, uh, you need to take the gradient of x momentum with x gradient of uh, y momentum with y okay and then add them together okay and then look at the whole equation you can understand you will get do square p by do x square do square p by do y square okay this you will get anyways and the other terms will be in terms of velocity so this is the actual uh, pressure poisson equation okay Uh, which you will be solving in the code okay so i hope this is understood um, first of all my screen is visible right because some of you have joined now just i want to ask can you reply on the chat box whether my screen is visible or not okay okay thank you so yeah as i said now you have got a pressure poisson equation and uh, you will be solving the uh momentum equation also or to first predict the uh, velocity okay so in general what steps we follow is that first we calculate what is the residual this do u by do x plus do v by do y and using that we try to calculate the pressure uh, by solving this uh, pressure poisson equation so that's the whole step and after uh, once we get the pressure we can just directly solve the momentum equation directly to get the velocities okay so it's a three step procedure okay we will see these three steps in our code okay so i have written a, a small c program okay which uh, kind of demonstrate this three steps okay um, and first of all as i said uh, so this is a, uh, this uh, treatment this syntax might be a bit different with matlab codes which we are usually uh, seeing throughout the course but it's uh, the logic remains same anyways so i have defined the variables u v and phi phi is actually pressure divided by density so we just not dimensionalize kind of thing okay so that's the variable phi uh, that is that stands for pressure only okay and one more thing which you have to keep in mind is again we are using a staggered grid here okay we are using a staggered grid and uh, we are using mac algorithm to solve lid driven cavity problem so i discussed it earlier also uh, so what happens is that you have a cavity enclosed by a lid okay and this lid is moving at a constant speed of say 1 so this kind of problems are uh, mainly involved in your uh, mainly seen in your uh, uh, like paint industry or something like that so where uh, the conveyor belt kind of moves over a cavity so as to mix the all the ingredients so as to make a perfect mixture of gas or uh, mixture of paint or something okay so uh, when this happens and there is when there is some fluid inside this cavity uh, it kind of goes into a recirculation mode and it kind of increases the mixing efficiency and all there are some small vortices which are formed in this corners also okay so something like this happens okay so this is actually a benchmark problem why benchmark problem so this is very easy to set up you can see just the boundary condition is u is equal to 1 on the top uh, wall and all the other walls they have u is equal to v is equal to 0 and also the normal gradient of pressure dp by dn that is also 0 now on the left and right wall it will be dp by dx on the top and bottom wall it will be dp by dy okay so this is just the whole problem setup and it's very easy to solve so you can do non dimensionalization and uh, assume some reynolds number okay and then just solve this problem and compare with the available numerical uh, previously published results and all to check whether your solver is working properly or not so that is why it's a standard benchmark problem okay so this is the problem and uh, we were seeing through the code i think here yeah. so uh, as i have uh, said so this is just the declaration of variables 
so now you might uh, see in this declaration that i have taken u nx plus 3 and y by 3 okay so and one more thing let me tell i have, I have taken a collocated grid but i am solving it using a finite difference method okay here just for a better understanding okay so what happens is that so if we have some grid like this So we have four control volumes here okay and for that I need to have one two three four five okay five grid points I need to have now so so that is why it becomes nx plus one usually nx is the number of control volumes which I want say four control volumes nx plus one grid points I have to define okay now one more thing uh, is when we use this kind of uh, staggered grid we would also need to define some extra control volumes to implement the boundary conditions properly because in staggered grid we cannot store everything at the center na? we have to store, store the velocity at the right face and uh, the ve uh, y velocity in the top face x velocity in the right face so that we have to do right so that is why again we will be requiring some phase here so that is why we create a one more volume so that's the usual strategy there are some other strategies also which are used okay anyways so uh, th that is why uh, i have uh, nx plus 3 in this code uh, okay so i hope this is understood okay so uh, that's the whole point here of uh, declaration of these variables other variables are anyways normal uh, uvp and uh, del x del y del t you already know what they are okay now i have written this uh, phi y phi x okay what this means is that uh, derivative of phi with respect to y okay that is phi y and u2 x what is u2 x it is nothing but um, do u square by do x okay so that is why i have written u2 x u2 is nothing but actually superscript but i cannot write like that in the code so i have written just u2 x because uh, when you go to this pressure poison uh, what you will see is that you will uh, get uh, this multiplic uh, multiplication when you do you will get do square u square and all okay so the square term also will come into picture so that is why i have written these gradients okay u to x so that's the whole point here again u x x means uh, do square u by do x square okay so that's th that's the naming convention which i have taken here okay so that's the first part you kind of declare the variables okay and then uh, you kind of calculate the initial conditions so once you start with the time marching so this is the initial conditions anyway so once you start with the time marching okay as i said what is the first step so first step is to calculate the value of capital D also here I have written small d anyway in that particular PDF it was capital D so what is the residual mass flux okay so that you have to calculate because that drives uh, your uh, uh, this thing uh, what do you say the pressure poison equation the pressure poison equation has a parameter dou square phi by dou x square plus dou square phi by dou y square you have uh, in between so this is actually the LHS the RHS you have this do d by do t okay these terms are there okay so that is very important so it is very important to calculate that so that's the first step so what was the second step which I mentioned can you write down in the chat box like just before starting with this code I mentioned uh, two or uh, three steps right there are three steps which are involved in Mac algorithm um, so first step I have discussed now that is the calculation of the residual mass flux that is I have denoted it by capital D what was the second step can you write on the chat box yeah exactly uh, determination of uh, yeah pressure 
so uh, that is what is done using the pressure poisson equation using that uh, laplacian of uh, pressure uh, so using that particular equation which i showed just now uh, which is given here okay so here you have this this is actually the rhs term okay uh, do square pi by do x square using this you can calculate right so do square pi by do x square and all i am i will uh, convert it to linear equation using the, just a central difference scheme okay as i said i am using finite difference method so i'll be using just pi of i plus 1 minus pi 2 into pi of i minus pi of i minus 1 divided by delta x square similarly for this thing okay so that's the whole thing which i'll do uh, i'll just first write them down separately okay just so that the coding aspect becomes easy which you will see now in this code okay these are actually the uh, just the boundary condition for d which we need to ensure okay so that continuity i am just applying it same across the wall okay so that's the standard procedure but what you will see is that i am trying to uh, calculate uh, pressure using the pressure poisson equation but before that i have calculated all these variables so this is very important when you write any code okay this is a general uh, suggestion which i would give that always uh, don't jump into uh, such big equation directly okay because you have a very big equation so this is your lhs this is your rhs there are so many terms here okay so what you have to do is you have to always uh, say do square phi by do x square you have to take as one thing okay in your code you have to uh, calculate like parameter like you can write i x x and then calculate this thing okay and then keep it ready okay although i don't want to do for phi xx because that is unknown so that i want to convert it to ap aw and all so that i will not do like for example do square u by do x square okay this i will take as one i will write u xx and then calculate this term keep it separate okay uh, don't put in that one line final line okay uh, where you write ap aw don't put there okay you will get confused when you are writing the code okay so these are just some minute things which will help you in debugging the code very easily so okay so that is why uh, what i have done here is that to solve that first i need some ingredients ready it's like when you are cooking uh, uh, when you start uh, you don't directly jump into cooking right like you first uh, keep your ingredients ready uh, near you and then try to start cooking especially if you are doing it for first time if you are an amateur okay so that's the usually thing which is done okay you just don't don't get directly into things because you will get confused in between okay so these are just like preparing the ingredients so i am calculating uh, u2xx and then do v square by do y y uh, do y square okay so that's the term which was there in that pressure poison then this is like uh, do by do x do y of uv okay then dxx is do square d by do x square so that i am calculating using the standard central difference scheme okay this is your standard central difference scheme which you have learnt in i think second week contents or something like that anyway so this is this is how you do you write the code okay this these are just uh, some uh, standard procedures which you follow okay so one uh, this is how you prepare the ingredients so you have prepared the ingredients now okay and you are ready with the right hand side you can see i have completely defined the right hand side okay only on the left hand side i had this pressure thing so uh, complete right hand side is a constant thing so i have defined it instead of putting it in a one line so i took this ingredients and then using that i calculated okay what is my right hand side okay this q is also again i could have put it directly here but i just want to try to separate the things out so that while de debugging it will be easy so that is why i have kind of made it like a two step procedure now rhs is a constant value now you enter into this uh, gauss seidel loop now uh, the thing is that these iterative methods are explained in actually week 7 contents but anyway just uh, just i'll just briefly say so what happens is that you try to uh, come up with an equation something like this okay uh, or else let me just leave this aside okay just you have a matrix system ax is equal to b now here you have like a1 a2 a3 you have t1 t2 t3 
Now you do not know the uh, values of any of these variables t1, t2, t3. Okay. Uh, so first, let me just solve for t1 using the previous iteration values of t2 and t3. For the first iteration, it will be like the previous, uh, the initial condition. Okay. In, it will be the initial condition. Okay. So for t2 and t3, I'll be having some initial conditions. Na? So that I will try to use t1 is equal to I'll write b1 okay minus a2 into t2 now t2 I'll be taking from the previous iteration and minus a3 into t3 this I'll be taking from previous iteration I'll just calculate the t value of t1 it will not be correct because I am not taking the current this thing, uh, iteration value okay which I don't know uh, so I cannot take okay so that is how I calculate t1 now t2 I calculate using uh, t1 and t3 okay but i know the value of t1 at the current iteration so i will use that whereas t3 i don't know i'll use from the previous iteration so that this is as simple as that okay so that is the method in which you try to calculate t1 t2 t3 and you keep on doing this thing until you get a convergence okay convergence means between two iteration the value should remain same of t1 t2 and t3 okay so that's the whole idea of the gauss seidel method okay so you calculate this value, keep on calculating multiple iterations till they converge. Okay. Now that is why I have written while max error 5, max error among the pressure is greater than 10 raised to minus 6. Till it is greater than 10 raised to minus 6, keep on solving. When it comes less than 10 raised to minus 6, the error between two iterations stop, stop the iteration. Okay. That's the whole meaning of this. Okay. So now I have just uh, discretized this and written like RHS you can see very easily. I had calculated it initially only. Okay. Now these terms will come because of the Laplacian term. Okay. Now again I plus 1, I minus 1, J plus 1, J minus 1. This is like east phase, west phase, north phase, south phase. Okay. This I do not know. Okay. So I have taken it from say previous iteration or if I know it will directly come from the current iteration. So that is how they come in on this side, okay, on the right hand side, along with the right hand side, which I have already calculated here. So it becomes very easy now to so see that, okay, within two lines, I am trying to calculate fine. Now. Okay, and then I am trying to check whether it is same between two iterations or not. And the other step is, uh, usually what we do is that, uh, we, uh, what happens when we do this iteration is that, in the first iteration we will get say value of pressure 2 in the next iteration we might directly jump to 5 whereas the actual value of pressure might be somewhere below this 4 actually okay sometimes what happens is that uh, it kind of jumps directly and then it goes on jumping from 5 to 10 so what we usually do is we do end relaxation now in the second iteration i have calculated phi as the pressure okay pressure is equal to phi now in the previous iteration pressure was 2 so I will do under relaxation so that I come somewhere in between for the second iteration. Uh, so that the jumping is not too much. Okay, when when for some problems, what happens is that when we do well, without doing this under relaxation, when we just go on solving the iteration, it might diverge. Okay, so this is just one strategy which is usually used to avoid that divergence. This is called uh, under relaxation. Under relaxation or over relaxation, it depends on the value of W. Okay. So phi nu I have calculated here. Okay. Now if I write W is equal to something which is less than one, which I have actually, uh, it is it becomes under relaxation because I am uh, under evaluating the value of phi. So I will multiply phi nu by some value which is less than one. Okay. So uh, that come that takes the value down. As I said, phi it takes down to four. Okay. So that's the whole. So usually this is needed for pressure poison because pressure poisons are very tricky to get a solution. Although the equation is simple, but the thing is uh, physics wise it's a bit tricky. Okay. So you need to do some under relaxation usually if the Reynolds number is a bit high, say above 100 and all. Okay. Now that is what I have done. So this is the second step. What is the third step? Can you write on the chat box? So the first step was to determine the value of D. Second step, using that D value, I have calculated the new pressure. So what is the third step, the final step? So that is a very obvious thing that uh, we have to calculate velocity. So that is what we need, right? So velocity is the thing which we need. So again, for velocity calculation, 
uh, how I have written this code. Okay, so what you will need for velocity momentum equation you have. Okay. Okay, so you have uh, dou u by dou t discretized by u n plus one minus u n divided by delta t, right? And then what are the other terms you have? You have on the uh, like right hand side if I shift, you will have minus u into dou u by dou x minus v into dou u by dou y. This is for x momentum I am writing. Okay, minus dou p by dou x you will have. Okay, plus mu nu into del Laplacian of x velocity. Okay, so this Laplacian again you are you can calculate dou square u by dou x square that is in central uh, central difference scheme. Okay, so this is the whole thing. So uh, I I I will not put all these things in one line. Okay, I will not put them all together. Okay, in one line I will end up with trouble if I do that. Okay, uh, that will be a big mess to do. Okay, so what is usually done? First I calculate u x. In the code, but this is nothing but dou u by dou x using some central difference, okay, something like that. Then in my code, I'll write u into u x. U x means my this thing minus v into v y. I'll write something like this, okay. This is very easy to kind of understand all, all this thing. Plus minus p x, I'll write, okay. Plus nu into I'll write u x x plus u y y, okay. This is how you write in the code, okay. Just for easy understanding. Is equal to u n plus one. Now u n plus one is equal to u n plus delta t into all these things multiplied. Okay. So this is your whole code. Okay. Now let us come from a backward approach. So u nu is equal to u plus delta t all these things phi x that is what I have written. Na? Plus phi x into u this thing all all these things. Okay. Maybe I uh, took the minus sign here only or something. So I don't know. That is why. I think so. That is why minus d phi by dx I have not written. I have just written phi x. Whereas I have taken the sign here only in while calculating phi x. Okay. Uh, so I hope you understand that. Okay. So then plus nu into u x x y y. So this is the whole thing what you have to uh, kind of learn when you are writing big code. See for 1D convection and diffusion, uh, 1D, 2D conduction and all. Uh, that's the very simple thing you can directly write there. But when you are going with this a uh, big solver and all, you need to split it into small parts, write them first, and then take them and put it in your final line. Okay, that is how you do. It becomes easy to debug also. So I can see that if I have done some mistake, U Y Y, I can see directly. I can look here and see whether I have done something or not. Sometimes usually plus two I take something like that. Those things usually happen. Okay, never will a code give you uh, right results on the first attempt. That had that happens very rarely. Okay, even to me, uh, after writing so many codes and all, but th that thing usually doesn't happen. So there are some bugs here and there. You have to resolve them. Okay. Uh, so it becomes easy to resolve them. Okay. So this is the whole code. Okay. Again, you have calculated. Similarly, you can calculate v. Okay. So that's the third step. Three steps. You are done with my algorithm, and I'm just checking between two different time step. What is the error? And if it is less than again some uh, convergence, uh, I will stop the iteration. I will stop the code, okay, whole code. And then you have just the boundary conditions, the top lid, all those things. Okay, that is easy to implement. And this, this, this is for uh, your visualization. Uh, I am writing the variables. Okay. So just uh, let us try to also a uh, kind of uh, run this code if possible and see how we can try to visualize the result. Also, that is also very important. Development, application, and analysis. Okay, uh, so it's it should be a combination of all those things. So till now we have done in development only. So let us try to see how we can do this. So I need not. Uh, I don't require any special uh, software and all to run the code. Okay, my code. I'm just running it on my command prompt. Okay, this is the. This command prompt which where I am running. Oh, I am already in that code. So you need to, this is a C program. So you, you need a DCC compiler which usually comes with your windows. Okay, anyways. 
you need not install it separately so what is the code name uh, ldc ldc mac so first you need to write that uh, code uh, file name okay dot c file whatever is there then you have to create an output file okay uh, you can just uh, keep it as it is but usually i have a habit of giving the name for the output file also and then uh, i need to put some math libraries also using this math minus lm okay so this is how you kind of compile the code okay once you compile this code what happens is that you get an exe file okay uh, that is the executable file and now it has been generated which was not there earlier okay ldc mac.exe now you need to just run this you have compiled it so it will take some time uh, anyways to run this code but uh, are there any queries with respect to uh, this code if there are any queries please write down on the chat box Anthony, can you unmute and speak? I did not get your question. What type of program? This is C program. What do you want to ask? Yes, you have answered the question. Okay, C program. Yeah, this is C language. So, any other queries regarding the implementation? Like we have done it in three steps. Any queries with respect to those three steps? Okay, so I think that uh, it has solved. Okay, now you can see that 933 iteration, the uh, maximum error came to 10 raised to minus 6 and then it will go below. So that is why it has stopped. Okay, so now I have this uh, results.dat file which, through which I can visualize. Okay, so that I will try to do using a software. This is an open source software. Okay, you can download very easily. This is called ParaView which we usually use techplot is a licensed uh, uh, software so so usually we don't get into that okay we have to purchase techplot whereas uh, paraview is an open source you can use that very easily okay so i hope that at least this uh, you are able to uh, appreciate the coding and you are able to see how you can uh, write code from scratch okay so that is the main intention uh, you should feel simple uh, it easy that's the whole objective because usually when you go through internet and try to check for little ribbon cavity codes uh, what usually happens is that you will get a code which looks very big and it has multiple files and you will get confused and all what the hell is going on okay so in such cases you should try to stick with the fundamentals and see how we can try to come up on your own some codes and just using the steps which you have learned okay so i'll attach this code anyways uh, in the google drive you can just have a go through and if you have any queries you can also uh, contact me i think my laptop is uh, going a bit slow Okay, so this is the results.dat file which I am loading. So yeah, so this is a, a whole square lid. Okay. Now you can see the pressure contours. Okay, it might not be very clearly visible because there is a very large variation. So if I say minus. Now you can see that near the corners there is a very huge pressure variation because the lid is moving in x direction you can imagine that and what happens is that here there is a corner condition which is created because of that and there is a very large pressure but if you see velocity you will get a kind of more uh, uh, appreciation for the flow okay okay so what is happening is that Yeah, so in this full blue region which you can see here side 
so there is a recirculation which is happening so there is a negative velocity which means uh, the flow is in the minus x direction okay so uh, the flow on the top whereas it is moving in the positive x direction after that it kind of becomes like this okay so maybe if i can get the more diffuse view i can explain that So I think this is more clearer picture. So you can see that there is a, a steep gradient in velocity which is happening near the top wall. Okay, and you need a very good result to get this uh, grid to get this result. Okay. So anyway, so that's about the programming aspects for today. Let us come to the week's content then. Okay, there is a query to run CFD codes. What should be the minimum desktop configuration? So this see my desktop which I am using. I am now using. I am using Google Meet. I am recording. I am. I am recording using OBS Studio, which kind of takes a too much space also. Okay, but even then I was able to run the code. Right, I was able to run the code, get the result for this. Okay, uh, there is a hype for of that. Okay, so usually people say we need a very high end configuration workstation and all. Okay, that is when you are using a software. Okay, software takes too much of RAM, and if you are using ANSYS and all, they take up too much of space. They took uh, take up RAM memory. Okay, uh, then you need to have a very good uh, configuration. At least I would suggest uh, 8 GB of RAM and 8 cores. Okay, 8 cores and 8 GB of RAM. That's the whole game here. Okay, it's about the physical memory, uh, the RAM, and then. It's about the cores, okay? Because your tasks get divided into different number of cores, and depending on your mesh size, the RAM will vary. But usually, uh, it takes ANSYS takes too much of RAM and all, okay? But if you are running a uh, your own cores and all, okay, like just like how I ran now, this will not take too much of space, okay? This hardly takes some I think 200 MB of RAM or something because usually I run uh, multiple programs. Uh, in my uh, for my research so it doesn't take too much space until and unless you go with a very fine grid and all okay it, it will that will take space 1 gb and all ram it will take okay so if you have your own codes you need not go for a very big configuration but if you are using ansys i would suggest 8 gb ram minimum with 8 cores and then that's the standard which you get in today's laptop my laptop i took long ago i have like six cores i think and four gb ram in this laptop which i am using right now okay okay so uh, are there any queries with respect to coding aspect which we have discussed today that was the first agenda so now let us try to get into today's topic yeah you can run your codes it depends all depends on the applications which you are trying to run if you are running a 3d code laptop might hang okay especially if you are using ansys and then running 3d codes as compared to your own 3d codes your own 3d codes will run okay on laptop with at least with which has like 8 gb ram and 8 cores but if you are using a 8 gb ram and 8 core laptop for running 3d codes and using ansys your laptop might hang and it might get overheated and all those things you need to have at least in 32 gb ram and then uh, say at least uh, 16 cores at least that thing but people do use uh, laptop uh, for running ANSYS and, and all those things okay uh, heating uh, nowadays these problems are resolved I mean, laptops are coming with good configuration but we for our typical research problems do not run cores on laptops we use workstations okay we have like 64 GB RAM and then we have good number of cores like around 48 and all so especially if you are going into 3d and multiplex and all you need good configuration so that is what i would tell okay so anyway so let us come to uh, today's uh, contents okay yeah so i hope this screen is visible okay so this week's contents is mainly based on the introduction to turbulence now this is as i said a bit uncomfortable topic 
for all for students as well as for teachers also uh, because uh, the thing is there is no particular definition for turbulence first of all okay if you do not know anything in specific about turbulence i mean the mathematical models are there but they are not very uh, to the perfect thing they are not the mathematical models are not the perfect thing for turbulence okay so it's usually that is why it's uh, when we hear turbulence it's what we get in mind is uh, chaos mess or uh, just uh, something which is not predictable okay so i would like to ask you people anyways what perception do you have of turbulence can you write down on the chat box because as i said there is no definition so we can just take up your own definition yeah whatever you have in mind you can write down maybe on the chat box regard regarding uh, turbulence eddies yeah irregular flow yeah 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 that's those are the exact things okay so we have too many recirculation okay we have too many uh, recirculation zones these are called as eddies or vortices okay and then you have a very irregular flow okay and uh, what else so you might feel that this is a i mean very uh, kind of tricky thing but uh, what i would say is that uh, without turbulence uh, this existence would have not been there okay the whole existence uh, in the whole universe is based on turbulence why i will explain see everywhere there is tu some turbulence which we see because of which the things are happening and because of which we are living for example from the sun we get uh, solar energy okay so because of which there are many things which are happening photosynthesis everything so that itself is happening because of the molten metals uh, moving in turbulence okay and then you have solar flare uh, solar storms solar flares it kind of emits heat uh, starting from that solar point i am taking so there also there is turbulence now uh, when you come to earth okay you have winds you have the formation of uh, droplets from which you get rain okay that also happens because of turbulent flow only okay if that was not there you would have not got rain okay now uh, let us uh, come little bit down to our own human body okay so we are we have started from cosmos okay let us come to human body uh, if you see in human body the heart kind of pumps blood so that it goes into every part of body the flow needs to be turbulent okay so that it the blood can kind of touch touch upon every uh, every organ of your body okay although in all the arteries the flow is not turbulent it is laminar but the thing is that starting point in the aorta the flow is turbulent okay so it it slowly loses its velocity and it becomes laminar later on but initially it is turbulent okay so you are your whole dependence is on turbulent flow okay that's the whole interesting aspect what i wanted to highlight here so the whole existence is on turbulence okay so I, now i need not discuss about the applications of turbulence okay without turbulence we might have not existed okay so that's the whole thing okay so this is the turbulence and, and the, the whole chaos kind of uh, has 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 created our uh, existence okay so and what we usually the way in which we usually define i mean this is like a class 12 definition or something like that uh, the laminar and turbulent flow we usually uh, like consider the flow in a channel and say the, the streamlines if they are kind of uh, parallel to each other they are flowing smoothly then we have a laminar flow and if if say these streamlines which indicate the flow direction they are not in a straight line they are not parallel not straight line i would say parallel they are not parallel at all then we kind of get into turbulent flow so that's the uh, i mean i mean i think the class 10 or class 12 definition okay uh, anyway so that is one thing so 
so let us try to uh, so now i hope you have kind of got some appreciation for turbulent flow and by this we understand that we have to learn turbulence okay we have to model those things okay so that we can improve upon things so see for example if there is some problem in iota if there is some problem in heart pumping you have to model turbulent flow right to come up with a device which can mimic such things which can mimic the actual blood flow okay but first you have to understand the turbulent flow na so you need to model it okay in in whatever accurate way possible as much as possible okay so that's the whole thing why we need to study turbulence okay i hope that kind of give some motivation to study this okay so yeah as i was telling so uh, how did this turbulent flow all together come in although this was there how did the people realize it so let us try to see that some history of turbulence okay okay i actually missed one thing uh, just pardon me i'll be just uploading it in the drive i wanted to discuss about simple and algorithm and a, a bit of difference with simpler algorithm but anyways i think the time does not allow us so so i will just upload the steps which are there mac algorithm anyway i discussed okay uh, along with the code also okay so anyway coming to the history of turbulence so uh, a great scientist renolds uh, so what he was doing was he was doing some he did not know about turbulence huh? first of all there was no concept of turbulence uh, during his time okay uh, so what he was doing is he was just doing uh, experiments in flow inside a tube okay flow of water you can say inside a tube now what he did is that okay i think this image itself got reversed i don't know somewhere this image has not come properly okay so what he was trying to do is uh, he was trying to uh, put some dye inside a flow uh, inside a water which is flowing inside a tube okay so when the velocity was very less okay when the velocity of that water flow or you can say the when the flow rate because usually they could not control the velocity they could control only the flow rate using the valve okay so they were able to control the flow rate and when the flow rate was very small uh, and when they injected dye into that uh, water okay so what he observed is that this dye kind of moved in a very straight line very uniform way okay now when he increased the flow rate he saw that dye was moving in a straight line till some point and then it kind of uh, diffused towards uh, the walls okay you can say it kind of moved in a, a bit of zigzag manner and then uh, after some time when the flow rate again increased to a very large value it was completely mixed mixed throughout the tube okay so that is when he told that okay the flow is chaotic after some point okay let us uh, call this as a turbulent flow because turbulent had a meaning but the turbulence flow concept was not there okay so it's a like chaotic flow so let us try to uh, define it like that so that is what he had in his mind now what he had observed was only with respect to flow rate but later on uh, he and his students they discovered that it's not only with respect to flow rate uh, when you increase the diameter of this tube also what happens is that the this this chaotic flow will be reached at a much lower flow rate okay so that is what they observed later on okay and then when you change the fluid also uh, this uh, achievement of chaotic flow happens earlier or delayed whatever it is so it depends on multiple factors how when this chaotic factor is created so usually uh, so that is why they came up with a ratio of two terms that is the inertial and the viscous force and they observed that when the inertial force which is determined by the density and the velocity which you can understand from the momentum equation it's like a momentum okay discrete momentum okay so when that inertia increases so it's like more uh, uh, velocity only indirectly okay so when that increases Uh, the turbulence is reached okay so that is what they see uh, that is what they saw the turbulence is achieved earlier when the inertia increases or else when the uh, viscous force decreases it is the same it's uh, saying in some another way 
when the viscous portion decreases the turbulence is achieved much faster so that is why they came up with a ratio that ratio was called as reynolds number later on that is basically the your ratio of the inertia and the viscous force this so this reynolds number was mainly introduced to understand the turbulence okay that's the that's the whole thing they wanted to see when it will become turbulent they carried on multiple experiments okay they carried on multiple experiments and uh, and then they understood that okay so when in inside a tube when the reynolds number this number when it kind of uh, crosses the around i think 2300 or something like that i don't remember the value yeah i think it should be 2300 uh, there is a transition when it crosses 3500 i think it becomes fully turbulent for a tube and for a flow over just uh, some external objects so over flat plate and all okay uh, you have that number to be very large okay that happens very late okay yeah with with when diameter increases will turbulent be established earlier yeah 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 so that is what they observed na so when they increase the diameter of the tube uh, the inertia of the flow kind of increases it is like it basically gets to move freely you can understand it that way uh, okay so uh, it does change so that is why i was saying in human body uh, the flow, blood flow is turbulent in aorta because aorta has very large dimension it has like i think around 4 cm diameter uh, yeah i think so it has like around that dimension okay um, so whereas if you see coronary arteries which are like uh, over your heart region the coronary arteries have a dimension of 2 mm uh, sorry diameter is 4 mm there whereas aorta has around uh, 2 cm or 4 cm i don't exactly remember i think the radius is 2 cm diameter is 4 cm so there it is in cm here it is in mm coronary artery so in usually in coronary artery you see laminar flow whereas in the aorta region you see turbulent flow that the basic difference lies in the difference in the velocity uh, the difference in the diameter okay because you have a higher diameter there okay so that's the whole thing when the diameter uh, increases the velocity decreases so okay so that if you are considering like Yeah, if you consider a same this thing only, okay. Uh, for example, your uh, length uh, for your same tube, but these are two different things, na? No? If I am telling coronary and aorta, these things are two different uh, arteries altogether. So, uh, in that way, uh, so basically, uh, that you cannot apply a one b one b two a two b two there, okay. And also, you can uh, see that what happens is that uh, usually. when you kind of uh, reduce the diameter by a factor of 2 the velocity increases by a factor of 4 so you can say that turbulence gets enhanced okay in that way okay it doesn't remain the same in channel it will be same diameter if you reduce by 2 the height if you reduce by 2 the velocity okay increases by 2 okay but in 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 a tube that 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 thing doesn't hold okay so uh but here there are there are two different uh, uh, channels uh, networks you can say okay uh, yeah so phi into 10 raised to 5 for external flow yeah yeah so that's the whole thing so it it increases when you go for external flow okay so so yeah so this was the, all about the history i would say then you have applications in every aspect as i said earlier and you have a very famous ex, uh, you know illustration in your a golf ball also so what usually happens is that if you take a very uh, kind of a very smooth ball which you see like in cricket tennis ball whatever it is so what happens is that there is a flow separation which happens earlier because of the smoothness of the ball okay okay you can try to physically understand this and there is a, a very big wake region which is formed wake region is nothing but recirculation zone where there is a negative pressure okay so that's the that's the that is called as wake region okay so with a smooth ball this thing happens okay now if you kind of uh, put some dimples which are usually uh, put on your golf ball okay so what happens because of this irregular surface 
is that the flow separation gets delayed okay flow will get separate at a later point okay you can try to physically imagine it okay when you have a very uh, rough surface there are some vo small vortex which gets generated and flow still tries to remain attached with the wall okay so that is why you have a very low wake region now what is the difference between this when you have a very high wake region okay what happens is that the pressure difference here here it will be like 3 uh, pascal here it will be say minus 5 pascal so the pressure difference is 8 pascal so you have a very high drag okay which happens okay whereas here if you have a very less wake region say this will be minus 1 and this will be 3 as it is so the pressure difference is 4 now as compared to 8 okay so it has reduced by 2 so the drag kind of reduces and the golf ball can move at a, a, a I mean, very long distance okay cavitation bubbles and all so that's a different topic altogether so okay so let us not get into that so because uh, see wake region yeah it can create uh, cavitation bubbles when the the pressure goes beyond that uh, saturation pressure and all those things but uh, that also has some applications but usually the main application which we see uh, is in the uh, uh, changes in the drag which we see okay so and that is why you have some small structures like this and that is why you have uh, these uh, structures in your airfoil also usually uh, this if you have seen airfoil uh, you have something called a small vortex generators which are, which are like rivets kind of things which are placed okay which are like some extruded structures which are placed in the airfoil if you see usually in the airplane so why these are placed these to make the flow attached especially when you are taking off okay when the flight take off takes off uh, so usually what happens is that if it if the inclination is like very large here so what happens usually is that the flow gets uh, attached very earlier and then again there is some problem of this uh, uh, high lift which is called as uh, stall problem okay so to avoid that problem uh, what happens is that you put this vortex generators which will delay the flow separation which now leads to a very less pressure difference delta p reduces okay so that's the advantage of putting these things okay okay so these are some of the applications of the turbulence okay and i hope you have got some application regarding this now coming to a mathematical model so so basically what uh, I would like to say is that you might think the model we have to do some special modeling and all. Yeah, we have to do some special modeling, but the thing is that Navier Stokes equations are still valid. Okay, we have to keep this in mind. Navier Stokes equations are still valid. Okay, you can solve these equations in CFD perspective in such a way that you are not doing anything, you are just using the normal Navier Stokes equation only. You are not doing anything extra, whatever like I showed the code na, in, the, in the beginning. The same code you can apply to solve the turbulent equations. And I am saying this with guarantee. Okay, you can still use the same code to solve the, um, uh, to solve the turbulent flow also. Okay, but it comes with a cost. The cost is that, see when you go into turbulence, there are very small structures as one of you indicated there are eddies these there are very small eddies in a very large scale flow okay so for example if you are considering this flow over airfoil which is like the scale is in meters okay i mean the length of uh, the airfoil the cord length and all they are in meters okay but these eddies are formed in a very small scale like like around you can uh, tell, tell one mm or even centimeter also you can take so if you kind of do that mathematics so the whole domain you have to kind of discretize into the size of that particular eddy and it should be less than size of that eddy okay to ideally capture that so what happens is that that whole one 
meter chord length you have to divide it you have to divide it by a uh, thousand number of grid points okay uh, so that one mm grid size you get at least one mm so that you capture that one mm grid id uh, okay and then you can solve the same code you can apply the same code but the thing is that you if you use a grid thousand cross thousand cross thousand i mean even the even the very good workstation will also take years to get the solution okay so that's the whole point here we cannot practically do that okay and when people have very huge amount of resources they do it and when they do it they call it as direct numerical solution okay that that itself is called as dns nothing else there is nothing big in that okay so they they resolve the flow into some scales okay that is called as column over of scale usually they call it as it's nothing but the smallest scale of that yd okay and then you select your mesh in such a way that you resolve that scale also you resolve that 1 mm scale also okay that's the whole game there okay and they have the resources so they can solve it okay so like do the simulation like on say 1000 cores you divide the whole domain into 1000 cores you do parallel programming you can get the solution okay so there is nothing new in that direct numerical solution okay dns but it's not relevant at all for industries industrial level problems wherein we want like within one week within at least within one month we want to get a solution okay so that's not a, a good thing okay Uh, that uh, DNS method in research people do use, and uh, in our college also some people kind of do for only for some problems. So they also don't do for all problems because it takes like around five six months to get solution. Nobody has that much of time. Okay, uh, that's the whole uh, game there. Okay, so I hope you have understood what is direct numerical solution and how we can actually solve that turbulent equation. Now, as I said, there is a there is an issue, right? we cannot go till that smallest scale so what we try to do uh, we try to come in a backward manner uh, i i will try to see the physics of the flow first say for example if i am doing that again flow over airfoil only i know the region where that small eddies are formed okay i know that region okay like as i said earlier i know that the that region is like this somewhere here okay wherein i have drawn this box now only in this box i will try to resolve it in a very small scale or else i will apply uh, your standard turbulence models which we will discuss anyways okay so in this particular region in all the other region i will just do i will do a large grid size i will just apply your normal navier i mean navier stokes equation doesn't change so that will be same so i will just take a larger grid and try to solve here i will apply some special mathematical modeling and then try to solve it so this is called as uh, les usually your large eddy simulation okay that's the whole, whole uh, plan here for large eddy simulation so i we have discussed like dns les okay these are like computational methods the most famous the most used one is actually not either of these two it is actually the k and epsilon model which we will briefly discuss now okay so this is the last part which i want to discuss before going into problems okay so uh, are there any queries with respect to characteristics of uh, turbulent flow and uh, how we can try to model it are there any queries regarding this okay there is one question let me just answer that one so what is the is there a theoretical limit for eddy size yeah maximum eddy size as a limit which we will discuss in the tutorial problem number 1 okay uh, minimum size can be anything okay minimum size it depends on the scale of flow which you are seeing like for example if i say millimeter scale the smallest eddy which i can at least resolve i can resolve is mm okay so but uh, using this kolmogorov scale you can kind of come up with that size also but the largest there is some limit okay that we will try to discuss the largest has a limit So yeah, Ayaz, you wanted to ask something. Sir, as you said, the we can install these on the point. Hmm. Is it, is it possible?
possible to analyze, like to perform a 2D analysis with a DG on air. We have to do a 3D because turbulent flows are usually 3D because you have this eddies going in all the directions. Like in some of the simulations I saw, uh, like flow over the cylinder, mm. they take a 2D analysis and they show those uh, like Gorman Street vortex as a 2D analysis. Mm. So can you perform the same way regions on a air flow as a 2D? No, have, they, uh, no, have they said that the flow is laminar or uh, for a cylinder I am asking? Uh, have they said the flow is turbulent? First of all, what was the Reynolds number, sir? Reynolds number was more than 10 to the power 5. Okay, and there they have done 2D analysis, you are telling. Yes. Yeah, see, people try to uh, kind of, uh, what do you say, model, uh, approximate uh, the things. Uh, usually, this turbulent flow is three dimensional in nature, but they might have kind of seen that, okay, see, 10 raised to 5 is like a transition region for flow over cylinder. Uh, the turbulent, it becomes fully turbulent beyond actually 10 raised to 5. Okay, uh, at least till 10 raised to 5, it is a laminar flow for a flow over cylinder. So they might have uh, assumed that it is still in transition and it, the cylinder is very long in the Z direction and they are trying to simulate somewhere in between uh, that cylinder and uh, the flow is mostly two dimensional. I mean, there are very small eddies which go in the lateral direction, but most of the other flow is in 2D direction and then they have turbulent flow. We can do that. I mean, there is no restriction on that. It is an approximation, I would say. That is an approximation and they might have got close results with experiments also. But usually the flow is... But here in airfoil case, uh, the thing is that you cannot take very long uh, airfoil and that's my issue. Okay. So usually what happens is that these airfoils have the specific length, no? or wing span, to call it, I think. Okay. And there is a body of the aircraft also. Okay. Okay. So you cannot assume that there they might have assumed very long cylinder and then they have done. So here I am not sure because there are some effects which come from this, uh, uh, this what do you say, I don't know, this end uh, edge also there are some effects which come in. So I don't know whether it will be a good thing to do. Like sir, uh, on the aircraft uh, we have seen that regions in front. So if I take an airfoil and just place that small triangle hmm. so that the drag rotation is changing or like uh, the flow separation is getting delayed but mm. in the 2D analysis and the Reynolds number is in the range of like 2 into 10 power 6 that range it's like really turbulent so is it justified to take a 2D analysis then airfoil with VG yeah I understood vortex generators you are placing but are you placing the vortex generator on the end side of this airfoil also? At the 20% part. Uh, so only in the in between if you are placing. Yeah, here I think it would, uh, you can, I mean, do with the, go with the 2D. Because see, if you are placing this uh, vortex generator, say, at the end, so then this end effect will have a significant role in the uh, flow physics in this vortex generator. But if you are only want to study somewhere in between, I think, you can go with a 2D, but the thing is you have to refer to literature and see um, how much effect this end uh, region will have on the uh, mid-region flow. Okay, So people will have performed uh, 3D this thing, turbulent flow in an airfoil. Okay? You will get literatures for that. So th from that literature, you have to understand uh, key how much uh, uh, effect you will get on the mid-region. Then from that you can try to understand whether the 2D analysis will be a good thing. But what I think is that if you are if you are placing uh, in between the voltage generators, then then it should be fine 2D analysis. Okay. Okay. Ah. But uh, for these these are like typical research questions which we also kind of see. What we the strategy which we use is go through the literature, especially experimental literature if we get that is more good. Okay. We usually see the literature and we see what is happening there and based on that we take the decisions. Okay. Uh, approximations are necessary, I agree. 3D you can't do every time. Okay. okay, so let us, if there are no other queries. Okay, so let us uh, uh, see the quiz questions. Oh, sorry.
tutorial uh, questions okay so yeah i just missed one thing uh, so this might have been covered anyways in your content also okay so how we do model is that uh, we just uh, say for example i have uh, some flow in a tube so this is a very laminar flow in turbulent flow usually i have some fluctuations over this flow so usually uh, through dns i can capture these fluctuations also but when i am doing a very large scale uh, simulation usually i try to decompose this whole flow into two components which is this normal mean component and the other component is the fluctuation component so u i write it as u bar plus u prime and usually the whole game is in identifying the model for u prime okay u bar u can calculate it using by using the navier uh, navier stokes equation you can calculate it uh, the only thing is how do you calculate u prime and this how u prime affects the u bar so that's the whole thing which you have to understand so now this u prime you have derived in the content also um, in the weekly content also we have seen that um, in momentum equation when you solve uh, when you decompose that do u by do t all those whole things uh, and advection terms diffusion terms uh, finally you end up with one term which is called as reynolds stress in the right hand side okay rho u dash v dash okay but now you have to uh, for this term you have to calculate u dash v dash to in order to calculate u bar okay so that's the whole dependence and for this u dash v dash we saw there are many models like k epsilon model is one of the main thing wherein we use the we use the uh, like concept of uh, energy cascade so what happens is that the energy needs to be conserved anyway this large eddy will break into small eddies so so using this we try to calculate what is the velocity of the small eddy from this larger one so you have seen some models to how to model uh, how to calculate this velocity so that was the whole content uh, wise that was whole thing but uh, what i would say is that uh, see these models will be there okay and you you need to have an idea of the, how these models have come in but you need not exactly remember those models there are so many things in that okay i, I don't expect uh, i mean i i am not sure whether you will get it in exam or not but i don't expect people to even i don't remember anyways the, what are the k epsilon model what are the terms in that okay that you can refer to literature you can refer to things then you can solve them okay only thing is you need to know how they came from uh, i mean what is the basic principle through which they came from so that you have to understand apart from that and see this is cfd course okay we are not here to theoretical derivation of those things okay uh, we have the models let us try to see how we can solve them okay so with that let uh, let me go into today's question because we have less the time here okay so the first question i think shiva had asked the question regarding this already uh, consider a turbulent flow in a circular challenge uh, channel which is nothing but a tube here what uh, can be the size of the largest eddy can you write the answer on the chat box what can be the size of the largest vortex this is the question any guesses okay many of you have said r and that seems to be the correct answer because see for example if you have a flow in a channel and if you have some obstruct obstruction okay so that is what i was speaking like in a blood flow also usually the flow is laminar in small arteries but you have some obstruction in the form of plaque or something like that say for example which is a like just like a fatty material then the flow velocity considerably increases okay Uh, and then the flow can become turbulent okay and then you can get a eddy which has can occupy this whole space of your uh, tube okay but even then uh, it is always limited by the diameter okay so one eddy can form in this one diameter region and then the size of the eddy is usually cal calculated by 
this radius of that eddy and that radius will be equal to the radius of the tube okay so that is why it it can have maximum up to r okay so that's the correct answer for this question okay i think many of you have given the correct answer okay anyway so i hope that there will be no queries but if you have any queries please write down on the chat box okay i'll be just going through the question in between if you have any queries you can write down now the second question is uh, instability the responsible mechanism for energy cascading process in turbulence okay so what happens is that the whole chaos or the unpredictable nature is uh, actually happens because of breakage of this big eddy to small 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 eddies okay and then that is why uh, that happens through the energy transfer okay that is called as energy cascading here okay and that creates turbulence now what is the mechanism behind that that is being asked in the question try to think it with a mathematical model okay wherein we got some the um, energy cascading process means the energy dissipation uh, that one right uh, it's not exactly energy dissipation i would say it's uh, the transfer of energy from larger scale eddies to smaller scale eddies yeah again this can be again divided into dissipation and uh, diffusion okay so you are talking only about diffusion i think okay so it is like a, a one level up of that particular thing which we are discussing okay so many of you have uh, written discuss term uh, but uh, when you have actually uh, solved uh, this uh, when you kind of derived i think the reynolds average navier stokes equation okay um, if you remember uh so i think you might have got this particular term from the uh, this uh, convective term okay uh, it was like rho into rho u by two. this rho into rho u by rho y from this term when you decomposed it and then solved it okay then i think you came up with this term Rho into u dash v dash. Okay, and that is the whole thing which is like called as Reynolds stress, and uh, that itself creates the change in the model. Since you are calculating for dou u bar, you have all the other terms in dou u bar, but only this term is there, which comes from this convective term. Okay, and that causes the whole change and instability. Okay, so that mainly comes from your uh, convective term. That is what I feel. Your derivation which we have seen. Okay. so definitely i think that should be the leading cause but as you said diffusion will happen because of viscous terms okay uh, i mean viscous diffusion will happen but the main instability in that mathematical model and which uh, kind of relates to the physical process also that comes from the convective term okay so that's the reynolds stress term which comes in okay because when you i think why you are telling viscous stress uh, i think is that that stress term you have decomposed into two parts one one was actually the viscous stress term but the other was reynolds stress it was written separately i think okay as far as i have seen so that comes because from convective terms but ultimately it, it is written in terms of stress term but that stress term it is written differently from viscous okay if you see that model also so in that sense this becomes a convective stress term okay how to characterize the instability so here what they mean is that uh, basically the deviation from the uh, normal navier stokes for u bar okay you, you if you want you can write a normal navier stokes for u bar there you should not ideally get u prime okay 
but here they come in so from which term they are coming in that will ultimately physically impact okay that will physically lead to instability in the uh, flow okay now how do you characterize that yeah through eddies you can characterize that but see the turbulence is not only characterized by eddies it, that is one thing through which you can characterize okay there are many things through which you can uh, characterize okay so you you also i think said somebody uh, that diffuse diffusivity okay when we saw in that uh, flow inside a tube the there was too much of mixing and all through other in other layer happened okay this is usually termed as diffuse diffusivity the other thing which you kind of see is dissipativeness so if if the no force is again applied then this turbulence dies out okay so that is called as dissipative nature of turbulence okay so those are some characteristics like see for example if you have a, a tank okay i have a water field in the in the small tank now if i just go on rotating 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 the water in that tank the flow will become turbulent okay now i remove my hand and then just i leave it okay now again the water will become stagnant right after some time the vortex things dissipate uh, okay so that is the characteristic again that is diffusion dissipativeness one thing is your uh, presence of large number of eddies of different scales okay so that is one of the characteristic so i told three characteristics now so there are many other characteristics like uh, it is characterized by a high reynolds number also so when you have a characteristics of this reynolds number and uh, uh, then you can call the flow to be instable and turbulent okay so that is how you kind of characterize the instability okay so i hope that answers your question here uh, also convective terms always associated with pressure gradient no i did not get this question shiva can you unmute and ask what convective terms how they are associated with pressure gradient okay okay no mic fine uh, so convective terms associated with pressure gradient see that the pressure in indirectly drives uh, the flow okay and the Uh, flow again drives the pressure okay there is a two way coupling which kind of exists but you cannot say the pressure gradient in which direction there can be pressure gradient in one particular direction which drives the flow so usually in every situation uh, we do uh, see that particular thing like you if you if you simply consider like flow in a channel also just the flow in a 2d channel also then also there is some pressure gradient due to which you get the velocity right and uh, and but that is in general not true but that is the very simplest case so if i take another flow wherein i have a quiet flow okay there is no pressure gradient uh, in quiet flow okay there is no pressure gradient in quiet flow but the the velocity the flow itself is driven um, by just the top wall being moved okay so there there is no pressure gradient which exists but still the the flow is there okay so in that way you can have so see there you have i think uh, do u by do y term also there so there is convective term which also comes in okay so you will have to look into case by case but i think what you have said is generally true but not universally true okay there are some cases where you can find that okay i hope that answers the question so here in quiet flow you can see that without the pressure gradient also uh, there is a flow i mean there is some velocity which comes right in quiet flow so i that self explain that without that pressure gradient also it can happen okay so th there needs to be some external force in that case okay now let us go on to the next question um turbulent flow how is it characterized again this is based on the characteristics can you write down on the chat box if 
should be the answer for this question. Third option. Okay. What about others? What do you think? Unsteady, irregular, periodic, three dimensional study that is correct. Okay. So as I said earlier. One thing is usually the turbulent flows are three dimensional inherently in nature. Although you can do some approximation and say, okay, at some particular region, the flow is two dimensional and do the mathematical modeling, do the simulations, that is perfectly fine. And you might get good, some good results as well. Some location that will happen, okay, but inherently, naturally, the flow are three dimensional. I have seen people, uh, especially when they work on these jet flows, uh, jet flows, you, they try to do axisymmetric simulation in turbulent flow. Okay, so that is also possible. Axisymmetric simulations people have done. Okay, so in that entrance region, that might be a good approximation near the jet entrance, entrance region. Okay, where they are mainly studying the flow characteristics. Okay, so yeah, but but in general, flow is three-dimensional in nature. Okay, okay. Um, Okay, C. I think many people have are pointing towards C. Okay, let us see. Uh, one by one, let us see. And the flow is unsteady. Yes, the flow is definitely unsteady. Okay, flow is irregular. Yes, the flow is that is one of the main characteristics of uh, turbulence, right? That the flow is chaotic in nature. Periodic, no. In special cases, it might be periodic, but in general, it's not periodic. It's irregular. It, it that that itself means that it cannot be periodic periodic means which repeats after some time okay so that that is not possible so three is not possible one two are possible and four as i said yeah generally flows are three dimensional uh, especially turbulent flows uh, it is not steady it's unsteady and it's not viscous also okay uh, so mo mostly if you have less viscous force then it is more turbulent right so viscous it's not that's not the thing it's not the correct so it should be, I think, one, two, and uh, four. Uh, one, two, and four. Yes. So I think most of you have got correct answer. It should be the option number C. Okay. So oh yeah, let us go on to the next question. Uh, next question is bit a uh, bit involved. So let us try to see it. Uh, consider two turbulent jet flows with high and low Reynolds number. Okay. So there are there is two turbulent jet flows. Okay, one has high Reynolds number, one has low Reynolds number. Then which of the following statements are correct? Okay, uh, size of the largest eddies are largely same for different Reynolds number. Now this is directly related with your first question. Okay, uh, you already know whether this is correct or not. Size of the largest eddies. Size of the smallest eddies are largely same for different Reynolds number. So you have to see whether this is true or false. Okay. Now the third option is the increase in Reynolds number. It results in increase in the size of the smallest eddy. Okay. With a decrease in Reynolds number, it results in the increase in the size of the smallest eddy. Okay. With a decrease in Reynolds number, it results in a decrease in the size of the largest eddy. So if you are sure with 1 and 2 you can be sure with 5 okay 1 2 and 5 are i think directly related they are for large eddies so for large eddies you know what happens okay so anyway what do you think should be the correct answer for this question so for large eddies you already know right from question number 1 we have seen what is the size of large, largest eddies because they are they are telling largest eddies okay they are not telling large eddies largest See, one thing is largest eddy is always restricted, it's always constant, um, it's restricted by your dimension of that tube or channel, whatever it is. Okay. So, 
so it is same for different Reynolds number the largest eddy which the flow can reach a largest eddy size of that particular characteristic dimension okay can the largest eddy cannot be different for different Reynolds number okay so first statement is correct the size of the largest eddy are largely same for largely same they have used okay it's not exactly same largely same okay scale is same the size of the largest eddy are largely same for different Reynolds number true so you can infer that fifth statement should be false right because largest eddy size doesn't change with Reynolds number okay so first statement is correct fifth statement is false now let us come to second statement okay size of the smallest eddies are largely same for different Reynolds number this cannot be true okay smallest eddies are determined by your turbulence turbulence in the flow you do not have this small 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 eddies in laminar flow okay when the Reynolds number is low only when the Reynolds number increases this small eddies becomes much smaller okay so the size of smallest eddies are dependent on Reynolds number so second statement is again false first is true second and fifth are false okay this is about this thing now let us come between three and four let us see it is quite interesting now with an increase in Reynolds number okay when the Reynolds number increases when the flow becomes more and more turbulent what is happening with an increase in turbulence you should read like that okay with an increase in turbulence it results in the increase in the size of the smallest studies just read carefully what they are telling it results in increase in the size of the smallest eddies. Is it true or false? Third statement, write down on the chat box. Okay, two of you have answered false. Okay, yeah, that's correct. It is false. So when you increase the turbulence, the size of the smallest eddy will go down okay it will further go down okay it will become more small eddy okay so this is false what they are selling is that it results in increase in the size so uh, the 2 mm will become 4 mm they are telling that is not true 2 mm will become 1 mm when you go on to higher turbulence okay third statement is also false so first is true second third and fifth are false okay let us see fourth option decrease in the Reynolds number results in an increase in this is again the reverse of third statement the fourth statement so it is true because third is false so fourth is true okay when you decrease the Reynolds number when you are coming to laminar flow from turbulent you are coming to laminar flow now uh, the smallest eddy will have very high size okay it's not very small so that is what they are telling okay so that is true okay so one and four are true all others are false okay so I think you have uh, kind of given the correct answer b should be the correct answer for this question you think you guys have given the correct answer okay any queries regarding this so this type of uh, uh, understanding based questions you can expect okay this as i seen in this assignment uh, many are not related to your mathematical model okay uh, because nobody expects also i don't know that you need to know that k epsilon model and all these things okay uh, whenever you get a question whenever you are solving a problem research problem or something you need to refer to literature see the model and then apply it okay okay but on an exam level understanding type of question these are important okay anyway one and four are correct answers so let us come to the fifth question the other questions are largely on a similar format so i'll just be ending it here so that i can ask i can take up some questions okay considering flow past an infinitely long flat plate okay there is an infinitely long flat plate aligned along x-axis what would be an ideal uh, reynolds number expression to characterize this flow okay you need to characterize the flow by reynolds number what how do you consider Reynolds number? now the Reynolds number you need length scale velocity scale uh, that's the only two aspects you know the viscosity you know the well uh, 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 viscosity you know you don't know the velocity scale the length scale and uh, what am I missing
yeah. and the density you know okay fine so you need to know only the velocity and the length scale you should choose that properly okay other things are easy so there are two options which are there in the question for velocity scale either you can choose the free stream velocity or the velocity within the boundary layer two options okay uh, which should you choose which velocity whether velocity in the free stream or velocity uh, within the uh, boundary layer velocity within the boundary layer keeps on changing and it is on a lower scale okay so you cannot characterize the turbulence properly using this reynolds number if you are using a boundary layer velocity okay the reasons are it is usually low lower than the free stream velocity and it usually varies along the height of this boundary layer okay of this whatever i have shown over here okay it kind of varies okay okay so so it varies from low to high okay you cannot usually characterize the flow you will be under predicting the turbulence using the boundary layer velocity so that is why you should go with a uh, uh, pre stream velocity which is much higher okay but do not apply the same logic for length scale now okay so length scale i have again two option width of the flat plate and distance from the leading edge now you might say that i i will go similarly like you i took u infinity i'll take width of the flat plate that's not true okay why uh, why because see this uh, length along this x direction it can go beyond the width of the flat plate also and it can increase your reynolds number okay and also what this that is first reason the second reason is that uh, what people have usually observed is that uh the this length of this boundary layer it is usually equal to the distance from the leading edge x okay so that is what people have observed and that's a good measure right like you want to really get into uh understand what is the this uh diameter say or the height of this boundary layer okay that there are people have found out that it is equivalent to distance from the leading edge so that's the reason that is the second reason why you have to Uh, take the distance x for the reynolds number calculation so it, generally it will become u infinity into x divided by viscosity okay any queries regarding this please let me know okay so this is the last question which i want to discuss the, there are other questions also but these are again based on fundamental understanding okay this how how do you characterize the velocity how do you decompose it is this you know very well and then i think the question is on uh, how do you decompose this uh, the reynolds stress term uh, into two different terms okay uh, this is not reynolds stress i mean this is the whole uv term how do you uh, decompose it in terms of reynolds stress and then this you already have studied in your weekly content so i'll not discuss much so you need to just decompose into u bar plus u prime and all and then just do the uh, your mathematics okay that you will anyways this and then you have one i think question on uh, what happens in the different layers in this flat plate so there are three layers we shall discuss there where in the uh, flow profile is very kind of uh, uh, constant and then it increases exponentially initially it is linear and then increases exponentially in your log layer okay so that's the, the question which are the three different layers uh, so that, again that's the um, understanding level questions these are okay these are not like mathematical modeling i did not find any questions which were related to kind of mathematical modeling so with this uh, i would like to complete this tutorials for this particular weekly content okay so let just to revise i have mainly kind of covered the mac algorithm the code for mac algorithm i have showed it and then i have illustrated how you can write your own codes okay and then we started with the importance of uh, turbulence just to get an appreciation for the topic and then we saw like uh, how how did this start like the history of turbulence and then briefly went into see we went into see what are the applications of turbulence real world 
then we solved some questions okay uh, mainly these questions as i said they are mainly of understanding level not too much of math and all okay yeah i think i ask you have a question do you have a question sir uh, huh. this diagram just reminds me of a question huh. what should be the first cell height when we are solving a problem ah huh, so that depends on your y plus it's value na for six you what are you asking repeat uh, what should be the minimum cell height or can you just clarify something on, on this y plus thing? on cfd na huh? ha when you are doing cfd simulation huh? yes sir. yeah 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 so that yes. depends on y y plus value see usually we try uh, depends on the flow situation so when we are having like flow over flat plate we try to restrict the the y plus value below say 10 okay below 1 also people say below 10 is also fine so you should select the cell size okay so now how do you calculate this y plus value so this y plus value is calculated based on the distance between the wall and the first uh, node center right so you know the y plus value let us say i will fix the y plus value to 1 and then i'll calculate the distance between these two cells d so that is how i calculate the minimum width of the cell in a cfd application problem but in ansys what happens is that you first determine the mesh i mean you do the meshing and then you calculate the y plus in the post processing and then see whether it is lying below 10 or not okay below 1 or not below 10 or not so that is a in the opposite way okay but in typical what we do we first calculate what is the width of the mesh then we do the meshing appropriately okay so that is usually the trend which we follow so that you have to do to uh, properly capture the flow again that's the whole idea okay nothing else you have to calculate that that small because there is a huge variation which is happening like okay so just to indicate why that is necessary uh, when you have a very wall bounded flow so there is a huge change in velocity which is happening okay afterwards it kind of exponentially increases and this is the saturation so here you have a very linear kind of profile which is very interesting so you have to capture this right change in the flow immediately so that is why you need that uh, y plus value okay is that clear yes i think so okay any other queries regarding today's content so what i have done is through this weekly contents i am trying to do the coding aspects but mostly many of you might have not been introduced to the numerical methods as such like this cost riddle and all which is like expected usually when we come into cfd uh, but these things are covered in actually week 7 contents that is what i saw <laughs> and uh, i don't know maybe it would have been better if they are covered earlier but anyways i have just given a brief hint about that but next week we will go direct deep into that numerical methods aspect once we get the linear algebraic equations how do we convert them uh, one we how, how do we uh, obtain a solution from those linear algebraic equations what are the strategies involved okay that is a very important thing that is the most important after your discretization okay the second most important thing but we had to go in a common path so i have kind of discussed them earlier only okay so that i in brief there are like other methods also a very stable method this might not be the, this might not be very stable this gauss riddle which i am discussing so there are many other methods like kelly decomposition and all that i will try to discuss next week okay and then next week we will be trying to solve again simple problems but we will concentrate on methods uh, to solve them okay so that way we will write the okay if there are any queries you can unmute and ask okay otherwise we will uh, meet in the next class okay thank you for attending so do you have uh, access to the uh, slides no i have made these slides no? which uh, slides are our lecture slides lecture slides we weekly content what are you asking yes. weekly yes. content Which lecture was this? Do you remember? I have like lecture this thing. I think 
think I have one book also. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Slides. Uh, uh, page number 242. Oh, sorry, uh, 245. If you are referring. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, when we look into the LSS, uh. shouldn't there be an A? <coughs> yeah. yeah, there should be. They have removed, they have not included it. Yeah. There should be A, uh, definitely. Because you are uh, uh, you are uh, doing finite volume integral along both LHS and RHS, and you are using Gauss divergence theorem, so it becomes a area integral. So definitely area integral you should get here. Uh, here RHS it's there. LHS, LHS also it should be there. Otherwise they can remove it everywhere. Usually I remove it everywhere because area is uh, constant of course. But uh, yeah, here it should be there. Yes. Then only we can cancel it. Ah, then only we can cancel it. Okay, sir. Ah. And one more doubt is regarding the TKE, which I was mentioning earlier. Uh, mm. So, if we can go to page number 397. Sir, mm. uh, here we are trying to derive uh, the TK. So, we have X momentum, Y momentum equation. Mm. So, in the top, we are uh, multiplying by uh, uj and you did the dash in the down ui dash so mm. sir, after that what we do is we, uh, i cannot understand what is the next process what is we doing okay maybe i have also not on in depth wait let me see what they have done multiply the amo this is a momentum equation okay so the momentum equation they have multiplied with uj dash is it right the x momentum uh, yes. only x momentum okay because this is general momentum equation na? or this is ah, dopi by dou x is there sorry x momentum okay uh, x momentum equation they have multiplied by uj dash and the equation below with ui dash and then average and then average means they are just putting this bar operator okay that's what they meant they are putting bar operator everywhere and then what do you want to ask like uh, okay uh, do we sum the x and y momentum together or do we just no, 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 no. Averaging means uh, they are putting that bar operator everywhere and then they are just decomposing them. Okay, so that is what they are doing. See, like what happens is that, uh, okay, you have, you uh, multiply the above equation with uj dash and the equation below with ui dash and then average it. Okay, so, so see, that can be, uh, what you are telling is also true. So, when we do that, you, you ultimately uh, get this, right? Right? Like, you, you I, they square you get, na? So that they are calling it as K, I think. What is there? K is there, na? What? Here. Yes. Uh, so that they are U square. The kinetic energy is half rho U square, na? So I think U square by 2 you are getting. So that is why uh, they are calling it as U K or something like that. Yeah. That was your question? No, actually, the top when you are multiplied by uj, huh. actually the top one is ui momentum. So you are multiplied by uj. Huh. So when that happens, uh, we get ui, uj, ui dash, uj dash, uk dash. So that was. Uh, so actually, uk is also there here. Not okay. And inside is ui. So you multiply by uj. So oh. uh, and after that, you we do average after that. So. On the, uh, I could not, uh, uh, I was confused whether we should like sum the above and below term together because I was not able to get the last term. Okay, first, uh, what is what is the difference between these two equations? So the top that? equation is uh, ui momentum. U, ui was mentioned. In, uh, I could oh. refer from there it as x momentum. And down is uj, which is basically like y momentum mm -hmm. equation. So on the top they no no it's not usually like that that's the i think that's not correct what you're telling this is not x momentum or this is not y momentum this is general momentum equation they are writing it like uh, i see what happens is that you i can take a value of one or two also if it takes one it will become dou b by dou x when it takes a value of two that is a tensor notation right it becomes uh, y momentum when it takes three it becomes z momentum equation they are just writing momentum equation in two formats that is what I can inform. That's just the tensor way of writing. 
in two different formats they are writing but this is a general momentum equation there you cannot say this is an x momentum or this is y momentum this is like x i is there i can take one or two value when it takes two it is dou p by dou y actually okay x2 we call it as y usually in tensor so they are taking momentum equation itself in two indices then they are what uh, they are multiplying by opposite index and then they are doing average so that's the concept i think which, uh, they are doing okay so what will happen is that then they are averaging it okay once they multiply uh, they are averaging so averaging means they are putting this averaging operator that's what i infer okay see because you have uk common okay you multiply here by you have ui so that is why you have u i you will be there multiplying by u j okay you will get u i dash u j dash here you will get u j dash u i dash okay what it will uh, mean is that these both equations will become same only okay now you are just putting a bar operator basically it's uh, that average operator you decompose the variables na then you have some average part so similarly that thing has come into picture so that is what i feel that is the the bar uh, operator because ultimately i think you will get same equation when you when you multiply this equation by uj bar and then when you multiply this below equation with ui bar uh, ideally you should get the same equation that is what i feel it's i don't ha so you will get same equation and then averaging means again it's the, it's the again the same equation but they are putting averaging means that uh, overhead uh, bar and then they are i don't know what what will come in the future i mean what they are trying to do there i think for turbulent kinetic energy definition or something like that yes but the, that is i think what they are doing but let me see i'll see it again and maybe in the next week i can answer more clearly thank you sir. okay Okay. And so, just to hmm. clarify one last doubt, hmm. when we're trying to find uh, the order of accuracy, because for hmm. the week one, uh, this order of accuracy we are finding it with O O O bracket X Y that's called truncation error. Hmm, truncation error. Yeah, the so, leading term in the truncation error that is the order of accuracy. Yeah. So we are using that to find the order of equation. Right? Yeah. So for example, if you are deriving the first order. Uh, forward difference scheme so then in the truncation error you will have delta x term leading term of the truncation error right? there, will, there will be delta x so that is how you tell that this is first order how is the second order when is delta x term? let me just explain so you have <coughs> cf at x plus delta x na how do you write it using taylor series f of x okay plus f dash into do f by do x right oh, sorry 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 delta x into do f by do x delta x into f dash whatever plus delta x square delta x the whole square by 2 fa factorial into f double dash okay now you are trying to calculate f dash okay what you will do f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x you will do so the whole thing gets divided by delta x and then you ignore these terms okay now this delta x square divided by delta x will come na no? denominator so you will get only delta x term so that that you have ignored from here on okay now the leading term will have delta x raised to 1 so that is why we call the it is first order correct that is the order that is the exponent of this delta x that is 1 here it will become 1 okay. you understood uh, na when we say mean to delta dos f double dash then uh, what will happen the delta x will come and it become second order uh, so second see f double dash you cannot directly calculate from this equation okay now you have to also write f of x minus delta x equation okay so then what will happen is this uh, do f by do x will go out okay then you will have delta x square okay you will have to divide the whole thing by delta x square right because you want f double dash here i wanted f dash i divided by delta x here uh, now i will be needing delta uh, f double dash so i have to divide by delta x square everywhere okay once i do subtraction of this f of x plus delta x x minus delta x now here similarly you will have delta x cube and delta x raised to 4 delta x cube will be associated with 
f triple dash again it will cancel out okay because odd powers will cancel out when i do subtraction then you will have f raised to 4 okay f 4 okay that will be associated with delta x raised to 4 this will remain now when you divide this by delta x square because i want f double dash so what will remain delta x square will remain so that is the first term in the uh, your uh, truncation error and so the order of accuracy will be delta x square uh, 2 order of accuracy will be 2 in that particular you cannot get a like with the thing na, f double dash x if you are using central difference na, you, you cannot get even order of accuracy uh, odd order of accuracy you will get only 2 4 6 uh, so that is how you derive the order of accuracy Okay. Thank you. Okay.